Now on BBC One, before Homes Under the Hammer, Matthew Kelly and more heroic stories. Hello. Critical Condition is about people whose lives have been changed forever by a medical crisis. And today, two survivors who've defied the medical experts against all the odds. Their lives have been saved by the people who love them. People who have devoted their own lives to bringing them back from the brink. And the woman who spent three and a half years risking everything to get her little boy a correct diagnosis. I think that, that I existed for Jake through that time. That's what I was there for. And he needed help. Jake Flint's mother, Lisa, fought for her son's survival. But that fight was to put her own marriage at risk. Her friends thought she was being neurotic. Her doctors suspected she couldn't come to terms with her child's illness. Even her husband doubted her, but Lisa Flint was determined to find the key to her younger son's critical condition. I was a nuisance. I was a nuisance everywhere because I only had to look at him to see that he needed help. He had this real gaze that every time things were going wrong for him, he would find me in the room and just look at me. Although Jake Flint's birth had been uneventful, even before she brought him home from hospital, Lisa had sensed something was wrong. I tried to get Jake to suck on a dummy and he couldn't do this and also feeding became a problem and he was feeding every hour just a tiny amount. He seemed to be in a lot of pain but couldn't work out why. Jakey! <laughs> Initially we, we spoke to doctors and midwives about the problems that we felt um, and we were told that uh, they were quite normal and no two children were the same and they all developed in different ways and eventually it'd catch up and there wouldn't be a problem. But it wasn't just the physical symptoms that disturbed Lisa. At times, Jake was inconsolably unhappy. At others, locked into a world of his own. He didn't like anybody to come in the door. He didn't like to, to see anybody new come towards him. He didn't like to see family members come towards him. In fact, at one particular point, nobody could approach him other than me. By the time Jake was a few months old, he'd become a regular in doctor's waiting rooms. Between naught to seven months, we'd been to a paediatrician seven times. On the seventh occasion, he was um, considered to, to have asthma. He was on a nebulizer every four hours. He was in and out of hospital with breathing difficulties. There were problems in the, in the night time. Happy birthday to you. Jake's first Happy birthday birthday and a rare smile for the family. Happy birthday to Jake. But Lisa was convinced her son's problems were far more serious than asthma. Not all the family agreed. I said to my wife on lots and lots of occasions that um, she was wrong and we needed to accept what people were telling us and we needed to follow um, their advice and follow the path that they were, they were saying we needed to, to follow um, to, the, to the point where we argued about it probably consistently. I think everybody doubted me. I don't think there was an exception. Um, I think that I talk a lot and um, I worry a lot and I think that, that at times people thought I was seeing things that weren't there. For Tony, the final straw came when Lisa insisted on getting more second opinions. Lisa had made another appointment to see a specialist and she asked me to go along with her again. She was adamant that Jake never had asthma, he was being treated for entirely the wrong thing and if anything what we were doing could be harming Jake because we were giving him medication that he shouldn't have been having. Um, she was 
she was probably on the verge at that point, I would have said, of maybe having a breakdown. She was extremely, extremely upset with all doctors because she felt we were getting nowhere. I finally bashed my head against the wall when nobody was really listening. Um, I got in the car with Jake and I drove off and I just disappeared for a couple of hours with him not really knowing what to do. Lisa and Tony had reached crisis point. For the sake of their sanity and their marriage, they decided to take Jake to one more doctor. We're seeing with another doctor in his office, he's telling us that he thinks, he's not 100% sure, but he thinks that Jake has cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is usually the result of failure of part of the brain to develop. One in every 400 children born in the UK is affected. Cerebral palsy is incurable. At last, the Flints had a diagnosis, but it was not news they wanted to hear. He told us that Jake would never be able to walk. He told us that it was highly unlikely that Jake would ever be able to talk. Um, he consequently would never be able to feed himself. Um, and the outlook was bleak. Reluctantly, Lisa accepted that Jake would almost certainly spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair. She set out to find a specialist centre that could ease his suffering. I needed to get things in motion, I needed to get therapy sorted out, I needed to get him to see somebody um, to make the best of this situation. But as the weeks and months went, she began to suspect that even cerebral palsy might not be her little boy's problem. Jake was constantly irritable. He recoiled at loud noises. His muscle tone varied. His eyes rolled back in his head. I just felt that doctors were missing something else. Um, Jake continued to be really sick. He was constantly um, dehydrating. He was uh, picking up viruses that the children would bring home. He was very unhappy. He would have absolute tantrums just before you were going to feed him. And he just continued to be very unwell. Almost despite herself, Lisa began to hunt for another solution. It was to be a long and lonely search. It was such a bad time. He didn't have a life, as far as I was concerned. He, um, he existed. Um... Two and a half years later, with more than 300 doctor's appointments under Jake's belt, Lisa found a specialist at Guy's Hospital who wanted to try one final test. It was a chance in a billion. He did agree to do some more extensive testing on Jake and he also suggested that we do this one particular test that wasn't routine, it was um, purely experimental. A week later, Lisa got a phone call that would change her son's life forever. I rang Tony, I said, oh, we found out what's wrong, you know. And uh, I think we sort of... <laughs> I think we both cried at that time. I just burst into tears in, in the office. Um, everybody walked out, left the place, and I'm sort of sat there. Somebody eventually bucked up enough courage and came in and said to me, um, is everything OK, expecting to, for me to say, oh, I've just had this horrendous news. And I'm trying to explain to somebody that I've just had the most fantastic news, because what Lisa had told me is Jake could be treated. The Flints didn't know it, but thanks to his mother, Jake was about to start rewriting the medical textbooks. Off we go. Later on, Jake's mother's determination pays off in a way that even she would never have believed possible. Just after his first birthday, Jake Flint had been diagnosed with severe cerebral palsy. Irreversible brain damage that meant he would never walk or talk or even sit up unaided. 
but his mother Lisa became convinced that the doctors had got it wrong. The reaction that we got was that I was really an over-anxious mother, I wasn't coming to terms with the fact that he was disabled, and he looked fine. It took Lisa two and a half years to find a specialist willing to try one last experimental test to check Jake's body chemistry. It was a very long shot. We had a phone call and it was Jake's neurologist and he said, we've, um, we've found something out. So I said, fantastic, you know, what is it? And he said, whoa, 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 don't get too overexcited. It is something that we could possibly do some treatment with, but even if we do, there's no, uh, there's no guarantee that things are going to change. The mixture of emotions that they must have felt when the diagnosis was made is difficult to really come to terms with because I'm sure mixed in that would be delight that a potentially treatable course had been found, but also the frustration of the journey and the search beforehand. Jake was suffering from one of the rarest genetic conditions ever identified. AADC is an enzyme deficiency that blocks the production of the vital neurotransmitters which carry information around the brain. AADC, aromatic amino acid decarboxylase deficiency, was identified in 1992. Only 30 patients worldwide have been diagnosed. Only three cases of AADC have ever been identified in the UK. There was just a chance that with the right medication, Jake would begin to develop normally. He was immediately started on a potent cocktail of drugs. When we first started treatment for Jake, I was really hoping that we could improve his irritability, that we could get him to be able to have control of his movements so as he could really start to interact with his environment, to learn and to, to get more out of life. Here he comes again. Almost immediately, a new little boy began to emerge. <laughs> Jake responded very well and he was commando crawling, he was much more alert. Um, and that, that was fairly immediate. None of the, the bigger physical things came till later on. Nearer. Six months later, Jake was trying to stand up. Flat feet. We were told, point blank, your son will never be able to walk. Full stop. So, obviously now, when we see Jake, and we see what he can do, it, it's just phenomenal. It's been an astonishing turnaround in a boy who'd been destined to spend his life in a wheelchair. Ready, steady, run! Oh, good running. Lisa is living proof that if you do question, then there can be an answer. But Jake is an exception for every thousand Lisa's, there's only, may only be one Jake. That shape is called an oval. oval. Jake was hungry to learn. Once he was up on his feet, it was speech that he tackled next. Green, well done. And... Jake's proud family can only look on in amazement and hope his extraordinary progress continues. The long-term use of uh, Jake's medication is unknown and he's writing the textbooks for that. The side effects from some of those are quite scary and the fact that he is so young and he is going to be going through some fairly heavy hormonal changes as he gets older, there is a tendency to be concerned about the fact that they won't do the job as well as they're doing. The cat's got on the green stick. But so far, Jake's progress has been the most rapid of any of the 30 children worldwide diagnosed with AADC. Oh. And what do we oh boy, need? We need a, a question mark. Oh, what is there a question The response Jake has had has been very satisfying. 
as a doctor to see such an improvement in his well-being and how he can just get on with life. Good boy, do you want to push it? <gasps> Can't, well done. But contacting other doctors that are treating these patients, there's a very variable response. And I think Jake is probably in a league of his own in the degree of response he's had, so he's doing extremely well. Since Jake's birth six years ago, there have been many landmarks in the Flint's lives. My wish would be that progress never stops and for him really to reach his potential. And I don't think we know what his potential is because he keeps on moving the goalposts back. In the end, Jake's recovery is testimony to his mother's courage and determination. Without Lisa, he most certainly would have remained trapped in a very solitary world. If Lisa had listened to me, then we, you know, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't have been here. Her persistence has got Jake a correct diagnosis. For us, it's just an incredible situation every time we see him. But for Lisa, only one very special person deserves the credit. Jake gave his total commitment to learning something and you have to have his sort of willpower um, and his ability to learn something to be able to achieve everything that he's achieved.